Now is, is really the, the fun part of this to introduce Bob Noyce, but I'm not going to say very much about him, especially since Tom Wolfe wrote a wonderful article about him in Esquire. And if you want to know more about him, that's what you should do, uh, is read a last winter's article by Tom Wolfe, and I can never be as articulate as he is about Bob Noyce. Uh, this is the 25th year of uh, anniversary of the integrated circuit invention. So it's also very appropriate that he speak about this and the rec retro his retrospective view of it for those 25 years. Uh, he's vice chairman of Intel, but more often known as the, the kind of, uh, if, if not father, sort of wonderful uncle of the whole industry in Silicon Valley. And we're wonderful, we're, we're, we're really delighted that you're here in Boston to help us pre-preview the Computer Museum. Thanks very much, Gwen. First of all, let me uh, tell you what a great pleasure and honor it is for me to be here on this very, very special occasion. I furthermore would like to add, thank all of you for uh, having such a taste to pay uh, a large amount of money for dinner. I hope there's some left over for the museum. I trust there will be. Um, it's interesting to me to see what an enormous amount of publicity the microchip has gotten recently, including that article of Tom Wolfe. And incidentally, on that article of Tom Wolfe, I do want to point out that Tom Wolfe is, first of all, a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> and only secondarily is he an historian. But everything that appears in print, of course, is true, as you've all learned. <laughs> particularly if you ever read something that you know something about. Well, after an article like that, you think that everything that could possibly be said about integrated circuits has been said, or perhaps after the, the last issue of the proceedings of the IEEE, which was on personal computers, there are the editors Amar Gupta and Human Tung were comparing the progress in the uh, computer and the and the aircraft industries and pointed out that if in the last 20 years the aircraft industry had made the same progress that the computer industry had, 767 would cost $500 and go around the world in 20 minutes on five gallons of gas. <laughs> the first time that kind of simile was used, I think, was by Bill Davidow, who is marketing manager at Intel at the present time. He was talking about a Cadillac that you would buy if it had, for the autos had improved as much as integrated circuits had since 1959. And uh, then it was that the Cadillac would cost you a quarter, and you wouldn't bother to pay a parking fee because you'd just put it in your pocket <laughs> after you got where you wanted to go. Well, it has been it has been a lot of progress. Certainly, the integrated circuit and the computer is now affecting every part of our activity. One of the things that I like to think of is that we as a society may be progressing in the same way that medieval education progressed. You may remember that the undergraduate courses were sort of the communication skills, the uh, spelling and grammar and rhetoric, that sort of thing. And then the graduate course were the quantitative skills, some very interesting things that were used in there, in arithmetic and geometry, obviously, but also then, finally, astronomy, which is a good, good way to see order in the universe, and then music. <laughs> 
And maybe there's a great deal of correlation between what is happening in the computer field and what that advanced education was in, in uh, medieval times. Since this is mu a museum, I think that it's maybe fair of me to be somewhat retrospective. Uh, as I was driving in tonight, I was listening to a Chrysler ad and it was pointing out that Chrysler was 60 years old. I think of Chrysler as being an old company. But uh, semiconductor business is significantly more than half of that. And as Gwen pointed out, the integrated circuit is 25 years old. So maybe we are indeed reaching middle age. It's interesting that only recently has it gotten a lot of attention. And I, I often thought that when the real fun was going on was back when we were making all of these vast changes. The reason it didn't get any attention, though, was because it was a tiny little business. This is a, a slide that I used in 1960, sort of historically uh, listing what the semiconductor market was at that time. In 1954, it was about $25 million. There was more money being spent by DOD on, con on research contracts than there were sales being made of products. And, but it did grow fast. That sequence goes something like 25 million, 35, 80, 140, 210, 360, 550 by 1960. And indeed, nearly half of that is two terminal devices, diodes. About half of it is uh, transistors. Silicon was taking a relatively small share of it. Most of it was germanium. What was going on in that decade of the 50s, those of you who were lucky enough here to, to be here last year, uh, heard about from Les Hogan as everyone was trying to figure out new and better ways of making transistors. At one of the Solid State Circuits Conference, there was a marvelous skit, I remember, which was an explorer's kit. And it was a kit to keep you from getting lost in the woods. It was it consisted of a little box. And in this little box is a little tiny cube of germanium and three pieces of wire. And if you ever got lost, what you did was to take the little piece of germanium and start making a point contact transistor out of it. Whereupon, ten people would lean over your shoulder and say, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> and then you would turn around and say, well, where am I? There were lots of things like that. One that, that I think shows how simple we can all be is that at the time we were making germanium alloy transistors very regularly. That would, the way you did this was to take a, uh, a piece of the semiconductor germanium in this type of case and put indium on top of it and melt it just enough so that the indium would dissolve some of the germanium and then recrystallize so it would leave that germanium doped with the P-type dopant that Indian was. You did that on both sides and you'd make a PNP transistor. Well, while all of that was going on, there was a great deal of research going on, too, trying to understand various properties about germanium. One of the things that uh, happened was when you heated germanium up and then cooled it down, it changed from N to P-type. And nobody could understand. At the same time, of course, we'd been making these transistors with the n-type germanium, with the indium in contact with it. And it was a couple of years before people realized that this experiment that was impossible to do in the laboratory, namely to heat up germanium and cool it down again without having it changed to p-type, was being done every day in the factory. And the answer was, of course, that the indium acted as a getter to pick up all of the impurities that were left on the surface of the of the germanium, mostly copper, it was learned later, so that it didn't convert the germanium. 
Anyway, all different kinds of ways of making transistors. Alloy transistors. Grown junction transistors. Can you imagine making a single bar of, of uh, semiconductor, pulling it from the melt, doping it one way and then the other way, over-doping, so that you have a layer slowly grown as thin as possible. Now, about the best you could do was a fraction of a mill, about a mill, and a mill was a megacycle. And so these transistors weren't very useful for anything except for hearing aids. They worked well in the audio range. It was in the uh, 19... 54, 55 era that we started worrying about diffusion as a way of getting impurities into these semiconductors. And that gave us good control of the depth dimension. And things soak into a solid very, very slowly. So that gave us really the control of the, that one critical dimension. Then the other, the question was to get the control of the other dimensions. I think that some of the first work that was done on that was done at Philco because they had used the, been working on this in the, right across the hall from the laboratory that was working on etching shadow mask tubes for uh, color television. And so they had all of the photo engraving things down pat. And it was suggested that that, that would be a good way also to uh, make transistors. There was some work done, being done at Bell Lab at the time. And uh, so slowly, photo engraving <coughs> replaced what had been used as a way of making diffuse transistors, namely making a slot in a, in a mask and then having one dopant evaporate through the mask that way to a plate, the other one through a mask that way to a plate, so they were closely spaced but separate. One would be a P-type dopant and one would be an N-type dopant. That was the way that... Well, there were all sorts of clever things that people were doing. Anyway, photo engraving worked out a lot better. Then the other critical element that was to set the stage for the integrated circuit was the invention of the planar transistor by Jean Herny. Now, the, the reason the planar transistor came in was that because transistors were terribly unreliable, you may not think of that these days because they're pretty re reliable now, but they got dirty. And in particular, what was wrong was that impurities on the surface of the transistors, at the junctions of the transistors, you could actually have more impurities on the surface than you had in this entire crystal of, uh, of the uh, semiconductor. And it was sort of blouse up the characteristics of the transistor, let me put it that way. So Jean's idea was to leave the silicon dioxide, which was a very good insulator on top of the transistor when it was being diffused, just leave it there. It was a good insulator and uh, protected the transistor, and indeed it did. There were some other, other things in the environment that certainly affected the transistor and the move on to the integrated circuit. But those were the things that set the stage. As far as the environment was concerned, the Air Force was working on things like Project Tinker Toy. They were trying to get all kinds of elements into a nice little square package so that you could stack them up and make nice square little modules out of them so that maybe you could put them in missiles or something like that. There was the concept of molecular engineering. That was the idea that you could create an electronic function by putting down a molecule of this and a molecule of that, sort of like maybe painting a picture by adding paint to the, to the uh, canvas until it created the impression that you wanted. Those didn't really work very well, but it did let everyone know that there was an interest in getting things small. The other thing that uh, I felt particularly was just looking at that there was an awful lot of hand labor in making transistors. Think of it this way, that we took a square inch of silicon, we were making transistor chips on those that were about 10 mils on a side. The chips were 
So that would say that a square inch would have something of the order of 10,000 transistors. Now, on each of those 10,000 transistors, I had to attach a couple of wires as well as soldering it down. Well, that was the day when the assembly plants, the employment in the assembly plants, outnumbered the rest of the company by two to one. And much of that assembly was and still is done in areas where labor is quite inexpensive compared to that here. When I was in college, my physics prop would very often put on my homework paper when I got it back, I'd go slave over something, finally get the right answer and hand in my paper and he'd come back with these big red markings on it. It would say, hard way. And then he'd, you know, jot down a couple of sentences which clearly made it much easier to do by using some other method entirely. But I guess that stuck with me and one of the characteristics of an inventor, I think, is that he's lazy, that he doesn't like to do it the hard way. Well, putting those 20,000 wires on those 10,000 chips of silicon seemed like it was the hard way to me. The other element of the environment was that the printed circuit was coming in. PC meant a printed circuit then. It means something else now. But the thought of printing a circuit on top of those transistors instead of taking the transistors apart and putting them in the printed circuit basically was the genesis of the idea of the integrated circuit. So you can see the elements coming together. The photo engraving so that you knew exactly where everything was on that wafer. It could be reproduced exactly. The planar transistor which left a perfect insulating layer on top of the silicon so that you could indeed put conductors on top of it which would not short out what was underneath. The need or the desire to have things small. There were some ideas that needed yet to be added to make that work. You had to get some substitute for taking all of these little chips apart so that they would be electrically isolated. Well, there were three ideas that popped up at that time. One was the junction isolation which was you put a back bias diode basically between each one of these things or a couple of them pointed in opposite directions so the current can't go that way or that way. And indeed I put that in a patent application but it turned out that Kurt Lehovec had thought of that years before he was at Sprague. Another technique that was thought of by Jay Last at Fairchild at the time was to have to etch them apart. Glue them down to something and then etch them apart. You still knew where they were and you could still hook them together hopefully. And Jay wrote out that kind of a patent application but actually that had been done at Bell Labs beforehand. The one that I did get a patent on I think was to use intrinsic isolation that is to convert all of the silicon in between things to an insulator. And I got the patent on that but it didn't work. It didn't work well anyway because the way to do that is to neutron bombard it or gold dope it and that means the lifetimes are too short and there's a lot of leakage current and that sort of thing. So the junction transistor, the junction isolation was the one that is being used broadly now. And then there were the question of getting the other circuit elements that typically are in those early deck modules like resistors and capacitors and so forth. Well, those were relatively easy. You can make resistors and capacitors out of semiconductors. We never did get around to making inductors and probably never will. But you can find some things that will substitute for it. Anyway, you had enough elements to go ahead and make the circuits. But still, after the original concept, things were very, very slow to develop. In a sense, the idea was there at the time but it was not practical to do anything. It's much like the junction transistor. Well, 
took two years after Shockley described the junction transistor before the first one was built. Uh, part of it was the tyranny of numbers. We're still not 100% yield on transistors at that time. Let's say that it was 60% yield. I'll make it easy. 50% yield. And let's say then we wanted to put 10 transistors together. Well, you got a yield of 1 over 2 to the 10th, which is a small number. Say you try, wanted to get 1,000 transistors together. Well, you didn't even think about it because it just wouldn't work. The other thing was that the early early uh, integrated circuits were still very slow. We were using simple logic forms, saturating logic, and they were indeed slow. As a matter of fact, if we look at that last picture, the, one of the first of the DCTL logic chips is that one in the upper right-hand corner. From there on, we go to about uh, two-year spread down to the lower left, to the lower right, and to the middle. As you can see, we are making steady progress. The other thing was that there was uh, a lot of market opposition to using these integrated circuits. How can I possibly use your circuit design? I really specialize in circuit design. I'm going to throw myself out of a job, sort of where, where it was. And uh, that was an attitude that was reproduced not only in the, in the 70s, again, with the mic, uh, with microprocessor. Uh, my specialty is designing computer systems. How could I possibly uh, use something that somebody else has designed instead? I lose all of my proprietary position. The other, the other piece of that was that it was a time when we did worst case design. That is that we took every element, tested it to the worst possible environment it could be in, and assured that it would work in that environment, and those were the only units we used. Now, in the integrated circuit, the transistor in the middle of an integrated circuit is not going into another electrical environment. It is going to have exactly the same transistors around it in every case. So the fact that the block works instead of the individual element working up to a, a given level is extremely important. Thank God, otherwise we'd never be able to make integrated circuits. Well, progress was made. Uh, and this is sort of the classic Moore's curve, that every year for at least a while in there, you could get something twice as complex as you could the year before. That extrapolates, of course, to uh, a million elements in 1980. We didn't quite make that unless you're going to allow for the introduction of new things like magnetic bubbles where indeed you had million bit bubbles by that time with no trouble. Also we had to change from bipolar to MOS up there to the, the newer circuit forms. What was the motivation? Well, basically the assembly cost of putting individual transistors together really depended on the number of leads that you had to had to attach to it. It's those 20,000 leads per square inch of silicon that we were talking about earlier. That was one cost element. The other cost element was the, was the decreasing yield as we go to higher and higher complexity, where the, where the cost then gets to be proportional some, to some exponential in the number of elements that is, that is in the chip. That the combination of those two costs will have a minimum somewhere. And that's all I'm trying to show on this slide. Incidentally, the, the assembly and test costs are not proportional to n to n, they're proportional to 1 over n. That's what I, it's a slight error on that slide. But, and, that, and that minimum cost, as we improve yield, you can see with the yellow line would, would have a, 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 a lower exponential and so the minimum cost would move down and to the right. And indeed, that is, that is why we've moved up, up that complexity curve. And it was done through lots of different ways. One is that we used 
larger and larger wafers. Believe it or not, back there in 1963, we're using 5 8 inch wafers. And in 1965, that was a one and a half inch wafer. By 1970, we got up to about a two-inch wafer. I should have had dimes on those others for, for uh, reference. The other thing that we were doing was to increase the die size, the die area. Now, really, what that is talking about is reducing the density of defects that would kill the circuit it became possible to use an ever-increasing area to put a circuit on and still have it work. That was just straight dog work, cleaning up the dust in the, in the uh, production machinery. The other thing that you're very familiar with is the drive to make things smaller. It has two effects. One is to get more on a given density, a given area of silicon, but it has another salutary effect too and that is roughly that the speed of these circuits is proportional or the delay let me say is proportional to their dimensions uh, speed is inversely proportional to it. and as we are getting things smaller and smaller we are getting things faster and faster and consequently more and more capable we'll see some other effects of that as we talk about what will happen in the future. One of the things that I like to look at is that we are now talking about in production two micron circuits, talking about one micron and seven tenths of a micron circuit. So we're you know, pretty well following this curve still, which was drawn in 1978, as I recall. But those are small dimensions compared to some others that you might like to compare it with. If we uh, look at this one, there's an index mark right here, which is 10 microns. That much is 10 microns on the screen. So what is that? That's a neuron. <laughs> That's what's making this speech synthesizer work when it works. <laughs> so we are indeed getting down to biological dimensions, and it is conceivable to talk then about uh, doing things that the uh, brain will do. There were a couple of new ideas that came in during this, this period of time that were important. One was the MOS versus the bipolar. The second was epitaxy. Prior to the use of ep epitaxy, we'd been only able to make the surface more impure than the underlying material. Now it was possible to have impure underlying material, high conductivity underlying material, that means, and put pure, pure semiconductor on top of it. So it was another great uh, uh, bag of tricks. The first set of integrated circuits was, were really pretty easy. They were straight Boolean functions and, and uh, gates and flip-flops and that sort of thing. But as we were getting more and more complex, there was real concern about what we would do with that capability. There was a problem of another tyranny of numbers. The, uh, the designers had a habit of having lots of leads come out of, of a circuit. And that was something that the semiconductor people just didn't like at all. And there were arguments ad nauseum as to what was the optimum ratio of leads to gates and so on. The one I always like to use was that it was simple at both ends. A diode had two wires to it and so did your TV set or your computer. But uh, the designers weren't buying that. The other, the other problem that we ran into was that as as we made things more complex and incorporated more of a piece of equipment in it, the fewer of those would be made. And it finally got to the point where you'd conceive of making, you know, this great huge thing, let's say the whole computer, and only make one of them. Because, as you know, von Neumann suggested that four computers would saturate the world's need. And 
we were talking about making things in the millions, and and uh, the computer companies were thinking of making computers in uh, tens of thousands per year, and there just didn't seem to be any reason why we would want to make 10,000 of something. Finally, it would be just the cost of design. There wouldn't be any manufacturing left, and, and we're still thinking of ourselves as manufacturers at that time. There was one element, however, that was like heroin to the computer designers, and that was memory. Give them a little bit, and they wanted a lot more. And so, as we were thinking about VLSI, we decided really that memory was the thing to you to uh, concentrate on. This is a picture of a, a large core, unfortunately, it's 15 mil core, on top of the first of the static semiconductor memories, the 1101. I think it's obvious just looking at that that what's under, under the core should be cheaper to make than the core. It wasn't, of course, but it should have been. And finally, <laughs> and finally it became so. It was very rapid phosphor reduction in cores. This is a slide I made up in 1970, I believe. No, 71, I guess. Uh, back when Intel was just a little company, so you drew your own slides on a piece of paper and, and took a photograph of them in your office. To get it reproduced to come here cost me $10, I'm sure. <laughs> but they were coming down. And each time we got something a little bit more complex, they became, became, became cheaper. And new ideas were coming in. The way you made them cheaper was to make them more complex. Same function there, 16 kilobits of RAM over three generations, each about couple of years apart. And this was a slide prepared in 1974, projecting at the time when semiconductor penetration was about 30% of the memory market, projecting that it would go to 80% in 1977, and indeed it did. And now it's about 99.99% of it, yes. The reason it did so was very simply that the memory cost kept coming down, just, you know, almost a factor of two per year. Better than a factor of two per year in the early days there. Then, the next one that came along was motivated by the fact that having, having gotten the cost of memory and, uh, down and really dependent on semiconductors, it looked as if it was then time to go back and do something more about the logic. And this is the story, if you will, of the, of the uh, microcomputer, microprocessor, I don't know what, quite which is which in common parlance now, they've been used interchangeably too long. Problem was, Still this one about, I have to have it done the way I've done it, so redesign, uh, take, take my circuit, my system, and integrate that into just a few chips. Problem with that was that if you looked at the total variety of various printed circuit boards that were being made at the time, there were thousands of them, and the cost of reducing one of those things uh, to a circuit design was in the tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. As a matter of fact, it is still almost true that the design of a circuit really depends still on the number of transistors in it and is almost linear in it. Now, you can say that's pretty terrible uh, performance considering the fact that you have computers to help, help you with and all of that sort of thing, but you might look at it the other way and say that if you have n transistors, you have n factorial different combinations of them, and what we've done is to improve the design efficiency by n factorial. I guess n factorial over n. But uh, we needed then to find a way, in order to take advantage of this, this new technique, 
we needed to find a way of finding large applications for a relatively few different circuits. And indeed, that is what the, the microprocessor uh, allowed us to do. I think what indeed was a new era of integrated electronics. Early on, they were used for calculators and simple controllers. But I recall going around talking to people who wanted me to do their custom design and uh, at the time, and I said, well, could you make it out of a PDP-8? And they said, of course. Well, how much of the cap capability of the PDP-8 would you use? Oh, very, very small piece of it. Well, what if I could give you a PDP-8 for $10? Would that solve your problem? Oh, yes. Well, here, try these. <laughs> and, and slowly, the idea took on. Now, it was not building computers at that time, but rather it was a simple controller that could be programmed to look to give you a given logic function. When you switch the, the thumb wheel in the seat of the 767, you're listening to channel 10 instead of channel 12. You know, little control thing. Indeed, that was one of the early applications, not on the 767, but on the 747. Then, of course, this little inadequate circuit grew up into the 8008 and the 8080 and the 85 and the 86 and now the myriad of different microcomputers that are are available in the world. And we are now indeed moving on to the era of getting uh, literally hundreds of thousands of transistors in uh, in those processors in that little chip of silicon. I might point out that the 6600, which was a very large-scale machine, the Seymour Cray design, and we'll see pieces of it in the museum finally, I understand, had only half a million transistors in it. And that was a supercomputer. That will be available within one chip within a couple of years. So we're you know, following behind at 15, 18 years from the supercomputer to what's available in the chip. Now that, I think, will continue. Where do we go from here? Well, I don't see any stopping. There are some trends. Uh, we'll move to CMOS instead of NMOS, just simply because it's easier to design with low power dissipation on that, on that piece of silicon. It gets too hot otherwise. And it's easier to, what you do with NMOS design now is to see how fast a particular node has to be and then tailor it to be that fast and use as little energy as possible. Well, with CMOS, you don't even bother. Just put them, make them all alike. Uh, bipolar will probably no longer have a, an advantage over CMOS as the dimensions are, are controlled. Uh, it used to be that the diffusion dimension, the depth dimension, was much more accurately controlled than the XY dimensions, the other two, the sheet dimensions. Now, uh, you can control them e equally as well as we go to X-ray and E-beam lithography and dry processing, some of these fancy new things. Well, where is the limit? It's quite a ways away. I think the fundamental limit that we're facing, and there are ways around this one too, is that if we're going to make computer-like equipment, we'd like to be able to change, tell the difference between a zero and a one. And to do that, we have to have signal levels that are large compared to thermal noise. And at room temperature, and this is the way you could get around it conceivably, that is not work at room temperature. At room temperature, we're at about 100 times or 200 times the level of noise now. It's probably safe to go down to of the order of 10 times or 20 times thermal noise. Well, the other part of the equation is that the voltage that is ideal to operate at for a microcircuit goes down with its dimensions. So if we can go down, say, another factor of 10 in the linear dimensions, that means we can go up a factor of 100 
that we, that we can pack in the same area. And indeed, if we continue the trend that we've had in the past, we can go up easily another factor of 10 in the dye area that we use. That means that instead of the 100,000 to million transistors that we uh, put on a chip these days, that within, oh, say, a decade, it would be possible to put between 100 million and a billion transistors on, on that same chip. If you could figure out what to do with it. <laughs> and so I think probably the question is, have we gone far enough? And we are, I think, very apt to fall into the trap of the early prognosticators who said that four computers would saturate the world's need for it when we say we can't think of anything to do with a billion transistors, which you can reproduce at will. So I think that the sky is still the limit and that it really depends on what we can imagine to use this marvelous new tool of electronics for. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.